Hello, Ambassador Martin Endick. Uh, it's a pleasure having you today. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, today, we're going to uh, discuss your book, uh, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. And of course, I'll ask you about the recent developments in the Middle East, the Abraham Accords and uh, the uh, peace uh, process between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. So, so thank you for joining me. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Hadil, for having me. Uh, so first, let me uh, ask you uh, about your book. What made you uh, dive into uh, the diplomacy of Henry Kissinger in the Middle East? There are some books about Kissinger's diplomacy, uh, but more in Europe. Uh, what's, uh, what are the significant things about Kissinger's diplomacy in the Middle East? Well, first of all, I am both a historian, a student of international relations, and a, a practitioner, although I don't compare myself to Henry Kissinger. We have similar backgrounds as academics who went into government. Um, but after my efforts uh, to make peace uh, between Israel and the Arab states and Israel and the Palestinians, first of all, as part of the Clinton administration when I was Clinton's Middle East advisor and then his ambassador in Israel and then his assistant secretary of state. Um, and then subsequently when I became the uh, special envoy for President Barack Obama and, and Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, I was involved, actively involved uh, in three efforts to try to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. And um, when it came, we were quite successful when it came to the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, but notably unsuccessful in the efforts to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, starting at Camp David. And then with the last negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians, it's, it's hard to believe, but that was in 2014. We haven't had any negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians since then. And I was responsible for those negotiations and they broke down in a notable failure, just like Camp David. And I thought that after those experiences, I need to, needed to take stock and take account and try to figure out what we were doing wrong, we, the United States. And, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around with the Israelis and the Palestinians, but the US was the dominant player in the peace process and we had something to answer for. So I decided that I wouldn't write another book about why we failed. I'd go back and write a book about when America succeeded uh, at the peace process. And that brought me to Henry Kissinger and his successful efforts in the 1970s to uh, end the Yom Kippur October 1973 war and launch a, an American led peace process that resulted in three Arab-Israeli agreements, took Egypt out of the conflict with Israel and Syria, and laid the foundations for the peace treaty that came between Israel and Egypt one year after he left office when Jim Carter was president at Camp David the first time. So that's why I went back to see what I could learn from a successful uh, effort at and American peacemaking diplomacy and what lessons we could draw from that for going forward in trying to make peace in the Middle East. Uh, yes, uh, but also you highlighted in your book uh, what you described as uh, one of Kissinger's uh, missed opportunities uh, in his approach uh, to uh, the peace process in the Middle East, and uh, which is uh, not trying to uh, solve the Palestinian issue in the Jordanian uh, context. Can you tell us more about that? And is it important, in your opinion, until today to uh, try to solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, through Jordan? Well, the, uh, you're right. In the book, I highlight the opportunity that existed back then. We're talking about the 1970s now. Uh, Kissinger had negotiated a disengagement agreement between Israel and Egypt, which separated the Israeli forces. They withdrew from the Suez Canal, and uh, the Suez Canal was opened. Um, and then uh, Israel also withdrew from the Golan Heights, a, a part of the Golan Heights in 
that stabilize the situation on on the Syrian border with Israel, a, an agreement which lasts to to this day and keeps the peace up on the Golan Heights, despite Syria descending into civil war, as you know very well the history of it. But so after he'd done those two agreements, he had the opportunity to turn to Jordan and to negotiate a disengagement agreement between Israel and Jordan, which would have put King Hussein back in parts of the West Bank, mainly Jericho, but with a corridor to Ramallah. And it would have reintroduced Jordanian influence into the West Bank. Um, Kissinger didn't want to touch it at the time. He uh, His attitude was uh, very hierarchical. He cared about the large powers, the superpowers and the regional powers. He cared little for small powers, and he cared not at all for non-state actors, which the PLO was in, in those days. And so when it came to Jordan, he, he said, that's Israel's problem. He urged the Israelis to talk to the king, to try to work something out with the king, but he made it clear that he wasn't going to get involved, that he was saving himself for another Israel-Egypt agreement, which would really as I said before, take Egypt out of the conflict and completely transform the nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict. After Egypt did this second agreement, there was no prospect for any other Arab state to launch war against Israel. But it didn't solve the Palestinian problem. He didn't try. And it was a missed opportunity, as I point out in the book, because Jordan as a state, had the ability then, has the ability today to anchor Palestinian aspirations in state institutions that can help to fulfill the obligations of statehood. And, and uh, the Palestinians have suffered from that. They don't have a state. They don't have state institutions. Um, they're very vulnerable to corrupt practices. And, and uh, we can see the Palestinian Authority, um, partly through its own fault, partly through the behavior of the Israelis, um, is is crumbling um, as we speak. So I think there was a missed opportunity there. Can Jordan be brought back into the process? That is a very sensitive subject, which the Jordanians will be quick to, to point out that uh, to go for Jordan to assume responsibilities in the West Bank would be seen by many Palestinians as trying to subvert their national aspirations. Mm -hmm. So the king, I think, is very reluctant to do that unless the Palestinians turn to him and, and invite him to come back in. He's certainly not going to do it to solve Israel's problem. And, and that's, you know, the Israelis talk often about a Jordanian solution for their problem with the Palestinians, the fact that there are 3.5 million Palestinians under occupation in the West Bank um, that aren't happy in that condition. Uh, he's not going to solve their problem. But if the Palestinians were to see it as in their interests to have Jordan play a role, I think that would change the circumstances. So it really depends on the dynamic between Jordan and the Palestinians. Uh, let me ask you about uh, what we witnessed today in the region, uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, do you consider the Abraham Accords um, a continuation for the same path that Kissinger and yourself and other diplomats worked on? Or it's a different issue? It's an, a different path? No, it's very much a continuation of, of Kissinger's diplomacy. And one of the things I, I point out in the book, which... Uh, I discovered as a result of going through all of the protocols of all of, his, of Kissinger's negotiations, it's not as if he wrote about it in this way, but he was extremely reluctant to try to achieve peace agreements. And the reason for that was he's very skeptical that states in the international system could actually end their conflicts and end their claims. His experience in 19th century Europe led him to believe that, that uh, it was dangerous to aspire to end conflicts because the effort to do so could actually 
produce war rather than peace. He called it the paradox of peace. So he was very cautious. He introduced this step-by-step -step diplomacy. Um, he avoided going for the big peace deals. And one of the reasons behind this skepticism was his belief that in the case of the Arabs and Israelis, it would take them a long time to reconcile with each other, to accept the other, to recognize the other, um, and to modify their claims so that uh, peace could, could emerge. He was wrong about how long it would take Egypt and Israel to make peace. Uh, he thought it would take a lot longer. But he was not wrong about the other Arab states and Israel. And it's taken a long time, as Kissinger expected, for them finally to come to terms with each other. The Abraham Accords are an expression of that normalization of relations, ending of conflict between the states in the Gulf and, and uh, North Africa and, and Israel. Uh, and so it's an important development, but it happened on Kissinger's timetable. Uh, that is to say 40 years after um, the, uh, you know, the breakthroughs that he had with uh, Egypt and Syria. How can the Abraham Accords, uh, a normalization deal between UAE, between the Morocco and Israel, uh, contribute to a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, it's not obvious that it is contributing. Um, I think that, that part of the reason for uh, the Emirates and, and Bahrain and Morocco to go ahead and, and normalize with Israel was a feeling that they couldn't wait any longer for the Palestinians, that the Palestinians had had various opportunities that they had missed and that uh, they were going to go ahead rather than cleave to the traditional Arab position, which you know very well, which is that there should not be no normalization until uh, an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital is created. So they upended that, that uh, principle and uh, in doing so, they, by definition, undermined the Palestinian uh, position in relation with Israel. Netanyahu was able to argue to his people at the time of the Abraham Accords breakthrough that it was peace for peace and he didn't have to do anything towards the Palestinians. And, and that actually was not true, as with many things he says, um, because uh, the Crown Prince of, uh, then Crown Prince of uh, the Emirates, uh, Mohammed bin Syed, insisted that as a condition for normalization, Israel would have to stop its annexation of the West Bank, something that was well underway at the time. And so there was something for the Palestinians, at least in the Emirati. Israeli package, but it was just a three and a half year commitment not to formally annex. It didn't do anything to stop the de facto annexation, which is moving ahead at a rapid pace now. So this brings us to the situation which is very much on the front burner these days, which is the potential for an Israeli-Saudi normalization. And, and the question there again is, what will be the Palestinian component to that deal, if any? Um, because if there's none, uh, then the Palestinians really are going to be left high and dry. And I'll ask you, of course, about uh, all the news about Saudi Arabia potential deal with Israel. A few days ago, uh, Riyadh appointed its uh, first ever envoy to the Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem. Um, how do you read this step in the context of what's happening, uh, the news that Biden administration is trying to sponsor an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Do you think Saudi Arabia is uh, telling the Palestinians, this is your uh, last chance, uh, try to seize it? Uh, what's going on? 
I do think that 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 is the message coming from Saudi Arabia. Um, but the the move itself that you refer to was, I think, quite a skillful diplomatic move. Um, bear in mind that the United States has wanted to set up a consul general or re-establish a consul general in Jerusalem for the Palestinians. The United States had that for many years, even before the creation of the State of Israel. Um, we had a consulate in, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but the, the Trump administration uh, got rid of it as an independent operation for the Palestinians. And the Biden administration is committed to, to reestablishing the a consul general there has not been able to do it, notwithstanding the influence that the United States has on Israel because of the sensitivity of Jerusalem and uh, the unwillingness of the Israelis to agree to the United States setting up a consul general there again for the Palestinians. In the Saudi case, they handled it with a good deal of diplomatic finesse. The ambassador is resident in Jordan not in Palestine, but he's credentialed as ambassador to the Palestinian state. I think that Saudi Arabia recognizes Palestine as a state, um, which has its provisional you know, center, capital, if you like, in, in Ramallah. Um, and, but it all, they added that it would also be credentialed to uh, deal with, as consul general in Jerusalem, and the Israelis didn't say a word, not a word, uh, of protest. Uh, and, I mean, partly it's because he's not resident. Um, the American would be resident in Jerusalem. But uh, partly it's because they've got something else going on with Saudi Arabia and they don't want to undermine the prospects of, uh, of a peace deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the relation between Israel and uh, Washington today. Um, we see that Israel is... Before we go on, can I, can I just say something a little more about Israel and Saudi Arabia? Because I think it really is a, a critical issue of the moment. And just as you, you posed the question, um, it's that... that this deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia is a complicated one. It involves Saudi Arabia's request of the United States for a full-fledged security guarantee, like a NATO Article 5 security guarantee in which an attack on Saudi Arabia would be treated as an attack on the United States. It involves commitment from the United States to sell Saudi Arabia the most sophisticated weapon systems in our arsenal, including F-35s. And it involves something very difficult for the United States to agree to, which is an independent nuclear fuel cycle in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and there are no requirements, at least that have become public, when it comes to Israel or the Palestinians. The Saudis aren't asking anything in particular of them. They're offering full peace and end of the conflict, normalization, and so uh, the question is, will the Palestinians be left behind or will there be a Palestinian component to this package deal? What is it that, these, that the United States should ask of Israel? What is it that Saudi Arabia should ask of Israel when it comes to the Palestinians? And this is, I, I think, a critical question, precisely as you suggested because if there's nothing in it for the Palestinians then they have every reason to oppose it, every reason to oppose any other Arab country from normalizing in the wake of Saudi Arabia's move or any Muslim country like Pakistan or Indonesia or Malaysia um, and given You mean the Palestinians? The way... mean the Palestinians yes. that they should oppose it? No, I'm saying that they will oppose it if there's nothing in it for them. Mm. Because they are. They uh, are opposing the Abraham Accords. They are opposing the Emirati, the Bahraini step, all of that. Right. Um, and that's created some 
difficulties for for the Abraham Accords countries. Netanyahu yes. is not welcome in, in the Emirates these days. An um, important uh, forum that was going to be hosted in Morocco has been postponed. You can already see the impact of problems on the Palestinian front in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and problems with this right-wing, far-right-wing Israeli government mm -hmm. causing uh, difficulties for the Abraham Accords countries. Um, it would be even more the case with Saudi Arabia because of a greater sensitivity in Saudi Arabia, its leadership position in the Arab world, its, its um, la much larger population with greater uh, sensitivity towards Palestinians. So uh, it's, it's a question mark at, the, at this point. It's not clear what Saudi Arabia will demand. The, the Israelis and Americans report uh, of their conversations with, with uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, that he said to them both that he doesn't care about the Palestinians. On the other hand, you've got the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia out there every other day saying there has to be significant progress towards a Palestinian state as part of the package. So we're not exactly sure where the Saudis are on this. And, and Biden himself has to make, up, make a decision as to what it is that he's going to insist upon because he's paying the bill in terms of what the United States has to do for Saudi Arabia and for Israel. Um, so he has leverage here. Will he condition it on a significant step for the Palestinians? Um, is, a, is an important question that's being debated in Washington these days. Um, if we uh, consider the U.S. interests in the region, uh, do you think the Biden administration or any future administration uh, should approve the Saudi conditions in regard of uh, the defense agreement and the uh, nuclear uh, nuclear uh, project that they are talking about? Because Saudi Arabia is saying we're not only not going to join the Abraham Accords, we're also going to ask China for help in that regard if uh, we don't receive uh, the help we need from Washington. So I, I have um, been an early advocate of uh, a security guarantee for Saudi Arabia. Um, I wrote about it uh, two years ago. And, and uh, I think it does, it does make sense in the context of reimagining the Saudi-American relationship in which both sides need to be more reliable partners to the other. Saudis have complained in recent years that the United States is turning its back on the region and is no longer a reliable security partner. And in Washington, there's a feeling that that uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is not a reliable partner either, that he gets uh, Saudi Arabia involved in this dreadful war in Yemen, um, blockades Qatar, act in, in the region in a way that is detrimental to American interests. So there needs to be a new understanding. Saudi Arabia is too important to the United States. The United States is too important to Saudi Arabia for this to continue in this way. So I do support a new understanding and new security guarantees. The nuclear fuel cycle issue is a, is a, a separate question. Um, and while the Saudis do have leverage in threatening to go to China for it instead. Um, I think the Crown Prince has made clear that he would prefer to do it with the United States. The question there is, what kind of safeguards can the United States place on the Saudi nuclear fuel cycle? What would they accept that would ensure that they could not cross over from enriching uranium for peaceful civilian nuclear purposes to using it to make a bomb. And, and that is the real challenge here. And it's not just safeguards that the United States would have to oversee to prevent that from happening, but it's, there has to be an answer to the question, what happens 10 years from now, Crown Prince is the king and decides to throw the Americans out, give up on the safeguards. Um, and that's a problem not only for the United States, but also for Israel. And it's a problem because what we don't want as part of a peace deal 
is to trigger a nuclear arms race in the region. And there's a real potential for that if, if we don't get that one right. So that's a complicated one. I'd much prefer that there wasn't any enrichment in Saudi Arabia, um, that there were other arrangements worked out, and maybe they can figure out a way to do that that gives the Saudis confidence that they will have a reliable, independent source of, of uh, enrichment for uh, new civilian purposes. Um, but it's, a, it's all indicates just how complicated uh, this deal is and, and how difficult it will be to pull off. Ambassador Indic, Israel is uh, less isolated today in the Middle East. Uh, there are ties between Israel and uh, uh, some Arab countries. Uh, but how do you assess uh, the U.S.-Israeli relation today? Do you think uh, the U.S. support for Israel is waning? And does that have anything to do with the fact that Israel is less isolated in the Middle East? Because we hear voices from the far right and the far left uh, here in Washington uh, uh, that are criticizing Israel or criticizing the idea uh, that the U.S. is uh, giving big support, uh, financial support, or other sorts of support uh, for Israel. Do you think there is a relation between the two things? I think that, that the relationship between um, the Biden administration and and uh, the Netanyahu government is very strained at the moment. The best indicator of that is that that the prime minister is not welcome in Washington. Um, it's hard to believe that he could have been in office for, I don't know what it is now, eight, nine months, and uh, not be invited to meet with the president in the Oval Office. It's unheard of, unprecedented. Um, and uh, it's reflected in, in something more profound um, in, the, in what's happening in the relationship. And that is that the, that you know, the United States-Israel relationship is always referred to as a special relationship. We have a special relationship with, for other reasons with, with the United Kingdom, but Israel is the only other country in which we have a special relationship. Why? What's special about it? It is American support for a Jewish and democratic state uh, in the Middle East. And, and uh, that has it has made it special because Americans identify with Israel as a democracy in a region where there's there, there are no other democracies as such. Say so Turkey is, but Turkey is not really part of part of the region. So, um, and and Americans support Israel because there's a sense of common values, not just common interests. That's what makes it special. But this far-right government in Israel is pursuing an anti-democratic agenda. It's seeking to put curbs on the independence of the Supreme Court and the judiciary, which would skew the system of checks and balances in favor of the uh, government, the executive branch. And, and that is causing huge protests in Israel ongoing 32 weeks of massive demonstrations with 67 to 70% of the public opposing what the government is trying to do here. And uh, President Biden has stood on the side of the protesters and told Netanyahu that he needs to, to form a consensus before going forward. And Netanyahu is not listening to him. And as a result, Netanyahu is not welcome in Washington. And this has created a, a, a kind of bizarre situation where President Biden wants to try to broker peace between Netanyahu and Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. Neither of them at this moment is welcome in Washington. So how, how is he going to do this? Uh, it, it, it uh, I think, is a reflection of just how bad the relationship is, uh, particularly between the United States and Israel. And so, yes, in terms of uh, the progressive base of the Democratic Party, um, they've opposed 
uh, Israel, opposed assistance to Israel um, for some time now um, in support of the Palestinians and against the Israeli occupation of, of the West Bank. Uh, but uh, they have been a, a pretty small constituency in the Democratic Party. Now with this crisis over Israel's democratic future, there's much broader opposition to what this far-right government is doing in Israel. And it's not just within the Democratic Party, it's with the American, within the American Jewish community too, which is on the whole liberal and progressive and, and uh, has been strongly supportive of Israel over many decades. But now uh, that, that support is in question. So it is in, in many ways a real crisis, a crisis within Israel and a crisis within the relationship between the United States and Israel. Do you think uh, we haven't seen an Israeli-Saudi agreement until now is because Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman does not want to uh, give President Biden this diplomatic win before the elections? I don't think so. I think that, that the question has been put to him. Does he want to conclude this deal before the elections or would he rather wait till after? The argument, I think, has been made to him that that if he waits for the Republicans, he'll have all the Democrats against him. Whether if he does it, as opposed to if he does it now with a Democratic president, he'll have Republicans supporting it. And so it's better for Saudi Arabia. And he seems to have accepted that argument. At least he's going to try. And Biden is prepared to try, see what they can put together. But it's a, it's a tall mountain to climb. Uh, for all of them, for Netanyahu as well. Because um, for Netanyahu, he, in my view, he's going to have to give on the Palestinians. And um, the Saudis are going to need cover. And the president is going to need it for his own base to get their support, because they at least care about the Palestinians. And so that is going to put Netanyahu's far-right wing coalition in jeopardy because anything of significance that he does or agrees to do for the Palestinians could bring down his government. So we've got an immensely complicated uh, diplomatic uh, tango here with three dancers. Tango is difficult enough as it is, but when you've got three instead of two, it uh, makes it more complicated. Thank you so much, Ambassador Martin Indyk. Thank you, Adrian.